Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. We are at the 12 p.m. hour, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to our last virtual table talk of our COVID-19 Global Crisis Series, centering the experiences of vulnerable populations. This virtual learning community was created to highlight the unique challenges facing groups that are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and to share out available campus and community resources. And as always, we are grateful for your participation and look forward to today's discussion. I do want to make a note that in earlier advertisements, we had anticipated today's conversation to focus on both homeless and incarcerated populations, but we quickly learned that there is so much to unpack concerning the challenges associated with both populations that we decided to, um, that today's conversation will solely focus on our homeless population. Before we begin, I'd like to get some housekeeping items out of the way. First, in our efforts to maximize um, distribution of this important information, we will be recording today's session and posting it on the My MSMU page for restreaming. We will also post the free community resources mentioned in today's webinar as well. Thus, as a friendly reminder, please keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the presentations. Secondly, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, we ask that you hold on to them until the end as we want to ensure adequate time for our speakers to share out. I assure you that time has been set aside for Q&A. You also have the opportunity to use a chat box to share your thoughts, ideas, or questions should you not um, want your voice recorded as part of today's session. Lastly, we've advertised that our virtual table talk spaces would be a half hour, but have certainly experienced that that is not nearly enough time to move through the material and still have an opportunity for engagement. So with that said, we will more than likely exceed the half hour mark and understand if you have to exit at that time, although we do encourage you to stick around and stay until the end of the presentations. I think that takes care of our housekeeping items for today. To begin, my name is Carrie Bolin and I serve as the Director for the Center for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Mount St. Mary's University. My role is to provide leadership and vision for programs and services that advance diversity, equity and inclusive excellence for all members of the Mount community. And as we made this shift to a virtual learning and work environment, Megan Stodden Ross, Program Manager for the Lotus Initiative and I, wanted to think through ways in which we could continue to marry our work of advancing social justice with what's most directly impacting our community members today. So in doing so, we set out to elevate the conversation around the unprecedented threat of COVID-19 to the individuals and communities we serve, those being high risk and vulnerable populations. Over the past nearly two months, you have probably seen headlines making challenges of our homeless populations across the nation. Over half a million Americans are currently homeless and rates of housing insecurity continue to rise in the midst of and in many cases as a direct result of today's global pandemic. Today we're going to learn more about the experiences of homelessness in Los Angeles in particular, who is part of these communities and how they are being impacted by COVID-19 pandemic and what resources exist to help support this often invisible and silenced population. To help deepen and broaden our understanding are two outstanding individuals whose life's work has focused on advocating for the underrepresented. Our first speaker is Carlos Amador. Mr. Amador serves as a community engagement supervisor at the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, LASA. Carlos's background is in immigrant rights organizing. Carlos has deep experience running field program, field programs for policy, legislative, and budget campaigns at the local, state, and federal level. He is the former organizing director at the California Immigrant Policy Center, where he worked from 2014 to 2019. He is also the former project manager for the Dream Resource Center project at the UCLA Labor Center, where he worked from 2011 to 2014. In his role at LASA, Carlos oversees four service planning areas across the Los Angeles continuum of care. He is also involved in the planning and execution of the Greater Los Angeles Homeless Count, the yearly effort to count people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. Carlos holds a master's degree in social welfare from UCLA and serves as a board member of the American Civil Liberties Union of Southern California, as well as a board member of the Granada Hills South Neighborhood Council. And our second outstanding speaker is Ms. Chelsea Byers. Ms. Chelsea Byers has spent more than a decade engaging community and advocacy efforts for social change. She currently works as the West Side Field Organizer for the Everyone In campaign, where she educates, trains, and mobilizes people into action to end homelessness across LA County. So we are incredibly blessed to have two powerhouse change agents with us today. At this time, I will hand it over to Carlos Am Amador. Mr. Amador, the floor is yours. I'll do a stop share if you have a presentation. 
thank you. Yeah, I, I just um, I thank you everyone, and I'm, I'm excited to connect with with all of you virtually. I hope uh, I'm guessing your your classes are still ongoing virtually, and uh, if you're wrapping up your uh, academic um, you know timeline, um, I wish wish congratulations and and best of luck. Um, I'm happy to connect here, and just I think just to get started, and uh, is Chelsea on the on the line as well? Is Chelsea on too, or? Yeah, she, she should be. Um, I, my hope is that she's okay. joining us in just a few moments. All right, no problem. Uh, I mean, I think just to uh, jump in and talk a little bit about um, some of the, you know, uh, experiences and uh, they, they put in a human face to uh, the issue of homelessness here in LA as well. Um, uh, as it was mentioned, over half a million uh, people experience homelessness in uh, the United States uh, at any given night. And California has the largest uh, number, the largest population of people experiencing ho homelessness of any state. Obviously, uh, California is the most populous state in general. Um, here in, in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles County, um, you know, based on the homeless count, the, the yearly count that we do uh, across uh, the county, we know that um, close to 59,000 people uh, experience homelessness um, across the county at any given night. Uh, and of that, in the city of Los Angeles, uh, you know, counts with the largest proportion of that number, around 36,000, a little over 36,000 uh, people experience homelessness in the city of LA. Uh, and obviously the stories uh, are vary greatly. They go from, uh, you know, whether it's how they fell into homelessness, uh, the duration, um, you know, of, of, of uh, being and uh, experiencing homelessness, as well as uh, how they cope with the stressors of uh, being in such situation. Um, we know that more than half of the people that experience homelessness for the first time uh, cite economic hardships as being the reason why they fell into homelessness. Um, and, you know, just, uh, and, you know, as I mentioned, like the stories are uh, varied greatly. And, and uh, in personally, one story that I, well, not a personal story, but a personal conversation I had uh, once with a, uh, with a, a resident who at the time was uh, housed. She, she was living, had been living for a long time, renting a, a house in the San Fernando Valley. Um, uh, I was talking to her just last summer uh, and she expressed to me how um, her, the owner of the house uh, decided to sell the house um, and therefore uh, she was gonna, she was, she had to, to move out. Uh, at, at the time I met her, she was having a yard sale, uh, trying to sell out her the, whatever stuff she had. And she mentioned how her aunt, who had been living with her, um, uh, re had recently passed away. And because she was sick, um, the aunt was sick, she she had taken a, a part-time job or part-time uh, position to help care for her, her aunt. But now uh, she was struggling with having to find a new place who was uh, much more expensive at the market, play, market rate that she was finding um, with a limited income uh, and you know, just trying to survive on her own. And, and she mentioned to me that um, though she had never thought about uh, her seeing herself in the position of experiencing homelessness and, and living without a house, she, she thought of maybe I'll put in whatever savings I have to, to purchase an RV and move into living in an RV. And so we know that stories like this, um, you know, uh, are you know amongst the, the community experiencing homelessness, um, and uh, and many many people, whether they're uh, working at the time, uh, you know, going to school, uh, living as in families, um, fall and experience homelessness. Um, and you know, really coming from all walks of life. So, um, and now with the current pandemic, um, obviously people are uh, people who are experiencing homelessness are at even higher risks uh, of falling sick. Um, whether that's you know because of health conditions, underlying health conditions, limited access to um, to healthcare uh, services, or even hygiene 
um, uh, equipment, hygiene services as well, and just the mere the, the mere exposure of the elements uh, that put people people at risk as well. So uh, we can talk more about like the, everything that has been that's been happening, and um, I wanted to to stop there to see if uh, I don't know, Kari, how you wanna manage or facilitate the conversation if you want Chelsea to jump in as well, or or um, if we should continue. Um, I was hoping that maybe you could continue based on some of the prompts I shared with you, Carlos, and then at that point, we'll okay. go ahead and turn it over to Chelsea. Wonderful. All right. Um, so I'll make sure to allow for Chelsea to have enough time. Uh, but just to talk a little bit more about like, you know, kind of like the composition and as I mentioned, the homeless count, which, uh, you know, we, we embark on every year. Um, hopefully some of you have participated on it. Um, it allows us to capture both like the um, the macro data, right, like the numbers uh, as a whole, but also some of like the details as we go out and do uh, surveys with people experiencing homelessness. Uh, from that, you know, close to 59,000 um, uh, of, of people experiencing homelessness in LA County, um, the gender composition is about 67% of them being male, 31% uh, identifying as female, uh, and 2% identifying as transgender. Um, also, you know, we know that close to 4,000 uh, uh, youth, um, and that is, you know, from unaccompanied minors, uh, all the way to 18, all the way to uh, age 24, um, about 4,000 of them are uh, living out in the streets and ex were experiencing homelessness and shelters, uh, which is about 6% of the um, overall population of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, also, you know, race plays a major factor on uh, who ends up experiencing homelessness. We know that for uh, uh, the black community and black people, they're four times more likely to experience homelessness than other, um, uh, than other races. Uh, whereas here in, the, uh, in LA County, the general population, uh, the general black population is about um, uh, eight percent. Uh, we know that within the homeless population, there's thirty. They represent thirty-three percent of the population. So that is a huge discrepancy, and we know that that comes because of the, you know, long-standing inequities and uh, social and uh, racial barriers that have impacted uh, the black community. Um, as in the Latinx uh, community, about 36% um, of the uh, population of people experiencing homelessness uh, is uh, uh, Latinx, um, compared to what the general population account is 47%. Uh, and white people are constitute 24% uh, of, uh, of people experiencing homelessness. So uh, obviously, you know, these are, um, uh, paints up a, a, a better picture of like who um, uh, is currently exposed and who is currently out in um, uh, in, in the streets without uh, shelter, uh, without access to um, the possibility of getting uh, on their feet. So obviously with the uh, COVID-19 crisis, um, there are uh, different uh, issues that are impacted specifically the uh, communities that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, you know, for instance, here in the city, in the county, and obviously all across the country, uh, there are shelter in place or, uh, orders, uh, but how can people shelter in place when they don't have a shelter, right? How, do, how can they stay at home when they don't have a house, a roof over their heads? And so that is a um, direct impact and direct, direct um, issue uh, impacting uh, people experiencing homelessness. Uh, it, it makes it hard to keep social distancing, especially for people that live in encampments. Uh, how do they keep social distancing? That is obviously very, very difficult. The limited access to hygiene stations, uh, you know, whether it's going to the restroom or having to wash your hands regularly, um, especially given that the uh, economy has closed, right? Like non-essential businesses have closed. Um, even restaurants and uh, stores have um, limited to just like takeout, right? Like uh, many of these spaces, many of these establishments, um, uh, people relied on, you know, being able to use to go to the restroom, to wash their hands, to clean themselves. Um, and now that they're, those stores are closed, um, it limits the ability to stay uh, clean and, and to access hygiene. Uh, 
uh, and so that is obviously a huge, a huge impact. Um, you know, we know that being exposed to the elements and the stressors that come from experiencing homelessness uh, also undermines one's immune system. So obviously makes people uh, be put at risk as well. Uh, but now here in LA County um, uh, with 15,000 people who are confirmed um, uh, testing positive of the coronavirus, um, uh, from that number, only about 47 people have uh, been um, who, who are experiencing homelessness have been uh, tested positive for for the coronavirus. So 47 people out of the 15,000 numbers, and I think um, that in some ways is because of the effort that is happening to ensure that we're uh, protecting and preventing the spread of the virus within the population experiencing homelessness. So, um, and that comes from everyone really being hands-on uh, to try to uh, protect the community, whether it's uh, the whole services system across the LA County uh, kicking into high gear to make sure that uh, folks are being informed, educated about how to best protect themselves, uh, being handed out uh, hygiene kits, uh, to ensuring that uh, other uh, actors, other agencies are stepping up, whether that's uh, at the county level, the Department of Health Services, the Department of Public Health, obviously collaborating with uh, LASA, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, um, and in coordination with uh, even the fire, the county fire department, uh, you know, the county education um, uh, department as well, and the state and federal actors as well. So everybody's, um, you know, really uh, working 24 seven to ensure that uh, we're protecting and providing and moving people, uh, especially those high, at higher risk uh, out of the street. So one uh, project I wanted to elevate is the project Room Key, uh, which, you know, it is uh, in coordination with uh, the state, but it's very much a local uh, coordinated effort uh, where here in LA County, there's a goal to um, uh, open and provide 15,000 beds or 15,000 rooms for people most at risk of um, being uh, getting sick or falling gravely ill of the coronavirus. Um, you know, this project kicked off, uh, kicked off uh, about three weeks ago. And as of now, we have uh, 15 hotels and motels in operation across the county. Uh, with uh, about 1,100 rooms or beds available. And these are, you know, hotels in different parts from, you know, Santa Monica to, uh, you know, Walnut in the east side of the county to Lancaster uh, to all the way in the South Bay as well. So um, this, uh, again, is a way to provide uh, an opportunity to actually, you know, shelter in place for especially for those uh, at higher risk. And so we also know, or we also work to uh, open up the uh, winter shelters uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, the winter shelters usually open up uh, at the beginning of December um, and, be, uh, and are open until uh, the end of March. Uh, the winter shelter is just a way of like providing um, that shelter for people during the most, you know, uh, dire uh, weather elements of, uh, of the of the year during that season. Uh, now the winter shelters are going to be open until the end of September. Uh, so that is also a, be, a big, um, a big uh, opportunity to keep people indoors. Uh, obviously, all of those uh, winter shelters, regular shelters that have been placed in term housing um, uh, projects all are now abiding by social distancing rules, uh, which also means decompressing some of those spaces, right? Where, whereas uh, maybe there was a hundred um, uh, beds or cots in one space that probably has been cut down in some cases to 50 beds, right? And so um, it's obviously creates more limitations. So I think at this time, uh, and one one of the the things to to consider, uh, especially within the campus community, on how to support uh, housing insecure students, um, uh, I think it's you know, and, and this may be already happening at Mount St. Mary's College. Uh, I'm, I'm unsure about what policies and practices are being uh, taken right now, but you know, keeping the dorms open, especially uh, making those uh, dorms accessible for housing insecure students, uh, even after the you know semester or the session ends, 
Uh, obviously, you know, this is this is not going to be something that ends at the end of the semester. It, it's uh, something that is going to continue on. So providing those, um, just kind of like what Project Room is doing, right? Like opening up, contracting, connecting with uh, hotels and thinking of creatively, how do we keep those dorms open for uh, housing insecure students, maybe also their families who uh, probably a lot of the students who are uh, housing insecure are, um, are, are going through that experience with their families, right? Right. keeping the meal, meal programs uh, running and making sure that they're accessible to all students uh, and accessible after the session ends. Obviously health services running, uh, it's obviously important, uh, you know, and the, the, the possibility of making the showers and hygiene areas like gyms and uh, other, you know, recreational uh, centers that you may have on campus accessible, maybe again, not only to students, but the families or the community members experiencing homelessness in the surrounding area, I think would be uh, important. One thing to maybe highlight as a connection to this is um, just in the last three weeks, uh, the YMCA or the YMCA as an institution uh, has opened up uh, a number of their uh, gyms or their centers for uh, 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 so possibly for shower programs. And so now uh, people who are experiencing homelessness who live in the vicinity or have access to a shuttle service that can take them to the YMCA can take, you know, uh, daily trips to take a shower, to stay clean, to stay, uh, you know, and to clean themselves. And so thinking about that, not only for the students, but the community members experiencing homelessness around the surrounding areas of the campus. And just working about, you know, providing more hygiene kits uh, as well. I think it's, uh, again, for the students, for the family members, for those in the vicinity. Um, what does financial assistance look like? Um, you know, we know that uh, that is obviously uh, continues to impact and will impact uh, students. So, um, and then just thinking in regards to uh, the uh, what what happens after COVID-19 is, you know, as, after we flatten the curve, after we have it under control, uh, and obviously, you know, one of the things that our interim executive director, Heidi Marston, has uh, said is that, um, you know, we can't go back to uh, how we were operating before the crisis, right? We can go back to, uh, you know, after the the room, uh, project room key ends, having those 15,000 people back into the streets. And so we need to make sure that that um, that we we are creating a system um, that provides uh, the shelter for those people and more, of course, right? Like a lot of creativity and a lot of um, policies that we were told were impossible before are being made possible now by the state, by the federal government, by the uh, local government as well. How do we keep those uh, and expand on them as well, whether that's again, providing more shelter, more interim housing, more uh, permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness, whether that's uh, you know keeping and expanding on tenant rights and tenant protections uh, across the, the county that have been passed in a temporary basis. Um, uh, how do we continue providing hygiene uh, stations also uh, beyond uh, and I think um, uh, you know Chelsea can talk about more how students and uh, the campus community can stay engaged uh, through everyone in and, and other spaces I'll stop there Thank you, Mr. Amador. I really appreciate that wealth of information that was shared. Again, as a reminder, if there are questions for Mr. Amador at this time, if you wouldn't mind holding on to them until the end of our last presentation, that would be most helpful. Now we welcome the thoughts and expertise of Ms. Chelsea Byers. Ms. Byers, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Everyone can hear me okay, I hope. Yes. Um, still getting all used to this tech online. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me and thanks, um, Carlos, for everything you just shared. Um, I think the overview of the experiences um, of folks who are unhoused in this time, um, I mean, I, we're, we're seeing so much of the same things, and I hope I don't um, create a lot of redundancies in what I, I share here, but um, I think we are coming at it from a little bit different perspective. So I'll just start by saying hello. My name is Chelsea. Um, I work as the Westside Field Organizer with the Everyone In campaign. Um, an effort powered by United Way to help bring the broader community all across Los Angeles into the work to end homelessness. We, uh, for the last two years, have really used this campaign to focus on um, affordable housing and really bridging um, what is known as our homelessness crisis um, into 
something that people can tackle, um, which is our housing affordability crisis. So on a regular basis, I'm working with community members to identify these solutions that can exist in their communities and help um, give people the tools to become better advocates for it. So if we're thinking about our homelessness crisis, as we do in this campaign, um, as truly our affordable housing crisis, um, to me, this moment of COVID-19 is sort of even more shocking um, than we may think about it just in this moment, because I think about the housing affordability crisis and COVID-19 as something that we're gonna be dealing with for much longer than just the stay at home orders. So, um, yeah, just to sort of um, pause and think about, yes, the first the real experiences of people who are currently now unhoused, um, what that stay at home order meant to, to people who didn't have a home to stay at. Um, I think some of that, that initial thing has been rippling through our communities for the last six weeks, just thinking about how to address the immediate needs of those who are currently unhoused. How do we deal with the capacity of our shelters? Um, you know, as Carlos mentioned, we had to decompress, right? We were opening up new bridge homes that now had to have people emptied out of them because they were too full um, for social distancing guidelines. So there's a lot of those immediate challenges just in terms of thinking of the 60,000 people who are unhoused any given night in LA County. Um, and for us and this Everyone In campaign, um, bringing it back to housing affordability, we are also focused on sort of that tip of the iceberg, right? People who aren't currently unhoused, but certainly will be if we don't get it in gear when it comes to thinking about policy and resources and what those community members need. Uh, in my typical presentations, we talk about, you know, the 600,000 Angelinos that are living at 90% of their monthly rent going, our monthly income going to rent every month. So that was a statistic taken by the Economic Roundtable. It's 600,000 Angelinos living at 90% of their paychecks going to rent every month. And that was pre-COVID-19, right? That was pre the millions and millions of layoffs that we're seeing nationwide and all the furloughed workers. We know that Angelinos especially have a very hard um, time when it comes to just making rent pay or paying rent every month. Um, and that's certainly true. I'm going to be more true in this moment. So for us, um, you know, we're doubling down on our commitment to protect and support renters, thinking about all the different tenant protection policies that are sort of missing when we look at this map of 88 cities all across the county of Los Angeles. Um, and we're really trying to help fill those gaps and make sure that people who are living currently in what is affordable housing or stays affordable housing to them so that we're not thinking of this uh, crisis of COVID-19 and homelessness um, years down the road as something that we, you know, we failed to think about these people who we could have just kept in their homes now, who didn't then become homeless, who didn't then become more vulnerable and then have greater needs down the road. So just started of adding a level of complexity to how we're thinking about um, the homelessness crisis in this moment. Um, you know, we're also thinking about in big ways what it means to keep doors open, right? We're, we've opened more emergency shelters, um, recreation centers are opening, the Project Room Key is doing a tremendous job of leveraging this asset of all of these empty beds across the county um, through our hotels. Um, but how do we keep these doors open or how do we keep people in what has become a sense of permanent, stable, supportive housing for them for the long haul? So in what ways can some of these motel beds that we're opening doors up to stay open, right? How can we use policy and resources that are out there to help convert some of these uh, motel beds into long-term supportive um, housing for people um, where the opportunities fit to do that? Um, and uh, more, more importantly than anything, just really thinking about um, that when that moment in time comes, when people are you know, sort of returning back to what feels like a sense of normal. Um, so much as Carlos indicated that Heidi is saying, you know, we're all sort of saying this, we can't just go back to normal as it was when it comes to people who are experiencing homelessness. We have to think of it, of what else is needed, how this can be a bridge to a new way of living, a new way of doing things, a new way of operating. Um, because I just think about, you know, what this experience has been like for somebody who's been unhoused, who heard stay at home, safer at home, and didn't have a place to go, who overnight, you know, experienced the streets of Los Angeles become totally vacated. What was used to be, you know, somebody's experience of waking up because of the rattling of cars, you know, the sounds on the, on the pavement every day, that's no longer the case. Where somebody used to be able to find a leftover meal in a trash can, that's no longer even there. We're completely have changed the experience of somebody who's living on a street. 
Um, and in the last six weeks, we've created a sense of new normal. I know I get emails, you know, on a regular basis from community members who are looking to us for support and guidance. You know, can we distribute this pile of masks that we've made to the encampment that's down the street? Or is it even safe to walk up to the encampment? I'm getting all these types of questions. And what I'm really helping um, point people to more because as information is changing every single day, we know thanks to LASA, we have this incredible network of service providers who are doing that direct outreach on the ground. It may not be the best place to infuse all of the volunteers that we're sort of catalyzing through the Everyone in Campaign. And my job is to help keep those folks focused on the long-term policy so that this is, doesn't become a moment where LA County starts to operate on bad policy as we've done for decades before but we really start to think about how we can expedite the creation of new affordable and supportive housing um, and that we can make sure that this, these doors opening now are bridges to that more permanent housing down the road. Um, just to add one more piece to sort of how my work has really evolved and then I'll make sure I'm answering all the questions that were specifically charged to me as well. Um, I, you know, I, so much of, of what my work was was helping people and communities realize that there's no supportive or an affordable housing building, you know, being cited in your community and that the people who are unhoused in your community could greatly benefit from this creation of new affordable and supportive housing. But when all of our city meetings sort of got cut, um, planning commissions got cut, we, we have created delays in the timelines and the construction of this housing. So I'm, I'm nervous as somebody who goes out and messages to community, you know, the successes, the failures, the progress reports around a lot of this public funding that's been, um, flooded into the into the scene through measures H and Triple H. Um, I'm really concerned about how we're going to continue to to indicate to people that progress is being made when we've had this huge gap in our ability to make progress. So um, you know I, I'm really helping my advocates, the group of people who um, who are showing up regularly at these city councils, neighborhood council meetings, um, advocating for uh, proven effective long-term solutions like the creation of new housing. I'm um, helping them stay the course in this moment so that we don't get burnt out, we don't just get discouraged, but that we know that um, post-pandemic we have a new world that we're fighting for and frankly that work begins right now. Um, and I think that this is especially important, um, you know, Carlos answered this question really well I think as well, but just what the campus community support should look like for housing insecure students. Um, I, I come from a community background working on campus and working with students and um, I think the little ways that students network and sort of identify their needs amongst themselves before making them clear the higher powers. Um, it's such an indicator of what these mutual aid networks are looking like, right? Um, we see that these ways of people just texting each other and saying, I need this, can you help me with this? Um, that's happening all of the time, but I'm, I'm really interested in thinking about ways that the university and that, you know, the powers that be are able to support those to create more access, more resources for people who need them. Um, I'm really interested in the ways that universities made assumptions, um, and I'm not suggesting that Mount St. Mary's is one of these, um, but what the universities that made assumptions that every student would have a place to go home when they, you know, canceled students' ability to be on campus. Um, I think there was a lot of ways that universities were unintentionally making assumptions that assumed that students had safe and stable housing already and weren't thinking of the underlying uh, housing insecurity or um, economic instability that may exist in a student's life. And I, a lot of those assumptions are sort of being, the veil is being lifted on them. We're seeing a lot more clearly the assumptions were being made. And I hope um, in Mount St. Mary's case and universities all across Los Angeles County that didn't get to the point of students becoming unhoused right, that didn't come to the point of students becoming food insecure, but that the university was able to sort of acknowledge that these may be instances happening and be able to provide that support before an assumption was made that would put a student out and leave the, the university sort of on the hook um, for being able to do something more. Um, so I, I really think that like the big learning lesson in this moment is that when an emergency strikes, it becomes very clear what type of resources and energy is there to, to make a difference and an impact. When it comes to homelessness and housing in Los Angeles, we were in an emergency state well beyond or well before COVID-19 struck. Um, so I'm really interested to think about how we continue to talk about homelessness and our housing crisis as an emergency after this big emergency has um, passed us and um, to start articulating what that new normal looks like, um, you know, in the year or two down the road, um, where we'll need to be in terms of policy. So 
I did a lot of talking. Um, I hope I answered a lot of questions without being redundant, but I'll pause and just um, see how the floor is at. Thank you, Chelsea. Greatly appreciate that. Thank you to both of our presenters for all that was shared. At this time, we will open it up to our audience for questions. Um, please remember, if you do not want your voice as part of today's recording, you're more than welcome to use the chat function. I have a question. Can I ask it? Please. Okay. My name is Sophia. I'm a member of the uh, w uh, Weekend Evening College. And um, thank you for doing this. Um, believe it or not, I was just working on my term, uh, term paper that's due this week, and part of it is on homelessness. One of the questions that I had is kind of off the grid, but I'm going to ask that anyway. Um, watching the homeless population increase as much as it did, has, over several years, I felt that there wasn't a big uproar until it reached communities that were of a higher economic scale. Have you found that that's the case and has the reaction been different? Hello? Uh, Chelsea, you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, and you're saying in the homelessness crisis itself not being um, an issue until it reaches or starts impacting its other communities. Well, it went to Venice. I'm from South Central, okay? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, no, you're totally right. So, um, you know, I'm just, and I was like, you know, it became a big, first they tried to rush them out and say, no, you can't camp here. It was maybe one or two people. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, with me from where I live, it was, it was, it, was, it became almost acceptable to people, which I never really got to that, but yeah. Totally, and you know, homelessness is, is one of the most visible faces of poverty, and I think you're totally right, until poverty landed on the doorstep of wealthy communities, wealthy communities were able to say, oh, it's not happening here, it's not happening to us, therefore it doesn't matter. If wealthy communities, especially here in Los Angeles, are sort of dictating or you know, pulling the, pulling the strings of our elected officials and helping really um, you know, point to the agenda, then of course it's not going to be made a priority, but certainly in the last few years, right, um, as homelessness, on, and you know, thanks to the point in time count, we can truly see on a map how and where people are at on a single night in Los Angeles, and, and it's everywhere. There's no geographic, but borders don't matter when it comes to homelessness anymore. And at the same time, it's become the number one priority to everybody all across the county. So I think you're, you're sort of right at saying not until it became an issue to wealthier communities. Did it become an issue at the top priority of an issue, of course. A real quick, a real quick thing also, um, the transgender, the homosexual, those who come out of, do they face a different set of issues than the uh, so-called uh, straight community? Carlos, would you like to answer that? Um, I think definitely, uh, uh, definitely there's a, a number of other issues that uh, impact the LGBTQ community uh, as compared to, you know, straight uh, community members experiencing homelessness. Um, obviously, <clears throat> uh, discrimination against uh, the LGBTQ community is uh, rampant. It's still happening and it's something that they, they have to face. Um, you know, access to adequate healthcare, um, uh, you know, it looks different as well for the LGBTQ community, especially for transgender uh, community members. Um, so it is, it is, uh, there are different issues and, and, and therefore there are different strategies that many service providers are uh, putting in place to try to uh, support um, those community members. Um, I think we also, um, uh, know that uh, especially for like youth uh, experiencing homelessness, it's a, it's a, they're less visible, right? Like they're less, uh, they're, they're harder to identify and to find, uh, which is also one of the, the complications when it comes to like uh, reaching out to them, providing service to them, and also ensuring that they're, you know, uh, being able to transition into, into housing. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. 
I have a question. Uh, this is Gail Krause from Campus Ministry. Thanks, Carlos and Chelsea. Wondered how many people are getting housed in those hotels and motels, and um, what's the biggest challenge to getting that happening um, fairly quickly? Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. So, there, uh, so today, as of yesterday, uh, there are 15 uh, hotels and motels across the county with uh, 1,100 rooms or beds available. I believe as of now, there's uh, close to 900 uh, people who have been moved into the hotels and, and motels. Um, uh, so, you know, it's almost that capacity and yeah. uh, obviously they fill up uh, very quickly. One of the other things that I actually forgot to mention, but one of the other things that was also implemented uh, soon after, um, you know, the city, uh, the city of LA uh, uh, put in place the order of uh, sheltering uh, at home is that they opened up a lot of uh, a number of uh, city uh, parks and recreation centers uh, to be you know, emergency shelters as well. Uh, also abiding by the social distancing uh, rules and guidelines. Uh, so that, that has been another place where um, individuals experiencing homelessness uh, have been um, uh, taken to. Uh, obviously everyone who is uh, being housed, whether that's in uh, winter shelters, emergency shelters, um, as well as the project room key uh, is uh, test not tested but is um, they're you know checked uh, they have to be asymptomatic they are, their temperatures checked when they come in uh, their temperatures checked twice a day when they're in the room uh, obviously no one is um, uh, required or, or or prevented from leaving uh, the facility right so but obviously everyone's encouraged to uh, stay in, uh, in 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 their rooms. Uh, but people are allowed to leave. But if someone leaves, let's say the hotel to uh, for for some chore or some task they need to do, uh, or just to get fresh air, um, every time they come back, their temperatures check once again. Um, and I think I would say, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges, and I'm I myself not working uh, directly on the project at the, at this time. Uh, obviously, I'm I'm supporting it, um, but I'm not uh, out in the field or on the hotels. Um, probably one of the biggest challenges is like just getting the um, the hotels and motel, motels up and running. Um, you know, like there needs to be inspections done in collaboration with the fire, the LA County Fire Department. Mm. Uh, there needs to be obviously agreements signed uh, between the hotels and uh, in this case LASA, and then just getting all the operations ready to go. Um, as well as obviously the staffing, right? Uh, that goes into into running. You know, I mean, right now it's 15. What what will it look like when we reach uh, and hopefully surpass the goal of 15,000 people uh, housed? And I just actually checked, and I, the number is closer to 1,100. I think we just got an update um, of people moved in, so a few more people to celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other questions or comments or thoughts? Any other questions? Um, I just thought really quick, I had, um, and I'm so sorry it took me a second to pull it up, but I have one slide that I, I would just pop onto screen and maybe anyone who wants to take a screenshot of it could, but it's a really sort of useful list of what all the different ways that are um, being thought about in terms of uh, people who are unhoused and what's being done right now. I'm sure it's not totally comprehensive, but just in summation. Thank you, Chelsea. Certainly. And actually, what might be helpful, if you, if you wouldn't mind, maybe sending that um, to my attention, we can go ahead and upload that along with today's presentation. Yeah, that's a great idea. As a resource. All right, I'll stop the screen share then. Any other questions, comments for our speakers? Just thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing, it's such a monumental task. And I, you know, it's one of the um, 
the major crises that we're dealing with in Los Angeles, not during, not just during this time, as you've elucidated here. So, um, thank you so much. And you know, the the Mount wants to support um, what's happening in the community. So, I look forward to hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, about more ways that that we can uh, take action and and be supportive through advocacy or or other actions. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. I want to second that um, and just thank our presenters again for their expertise and the wisdom that they shared with us today. While it is certainly clear that this is a labor of love for you both, I know it was also sacrifice of time as one can only imagine how impacted your schedules must be given this most challenging time. So thank you, thank you, thank you for making it a priority to join us today and present this most important information to our guests. Thank you for your participation today. We hope that you left with understanding or rather leave with a broader understanding experiences and unique challenges of our homeless population and ways in which to be an advocate and to be supportive. I think lastly we'll go ahead and uh, close out with um, not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. In fact um, we had our presenters kind of share out some other um, organizations that are really at the helm of this work especially on um, this particular time um, but just something to keep in mind especially if you're looking for ways volunteer and get involved um, and lend a hand. Um, I want to just highlight uh, the last piece um, as a uh, campus resource. Um, Student Affairs has gone ahead and created a COVID emergency fund. Um, so if you know of anyone um, uh, uh, that's in need um, of some financial support, please uh, direct them to our Dean of Student Lives, either Laura Crow or Jessica Cuevas, and you can find their information there. And as mentioned, we'll have these posted on our My MSMU page as well. Um, Another special thank you to our speakers and to our audience for your participation. As mentioned, this serves as our last COVID-19 virtual table talk, um, but please continue to keep um, up with us through Instagram and Facebook as we update you on our ongoing efforts to always center those voices that are on the margins. Stay so safe and healthy. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.